Well, I think number one, we have to be really careful that we don't only depend on the social media to get our message out. We got to make sure that we are there to tell that message. So welcome to SwineNet Canada. My name is John Patience and I'll be the host of today's session. And with me today, we have Harry Siemens who just told me that he is celebrating his 52nd year as an agricultural journalist. So what a wonderful experience he's going to bring to our conversation today. And we've got some pretty varied topic, everything from how to tell our story to the consuming public, uh, to advocating for agriculture. So Harry, welcome to our podcast today. It's a, a, indeed a great pleasure to be with you. And uh, you know, I love to talk about agriculture. I've done it for 52 years professionally. And secondly, I farmed with my father who farmed a thousand acres in Southern Manitoba in 1960. And he was an innovative farmer. And, uh, and so I really appreciated what he taught me. And at the same time, uh, what I've learned through the farming community about being a communicator. Great. Well, that's, uh, yeah, well, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. But but before we get started, Harry, I mean, it's hard to think there's very many people out there that don't know you, but maybe they don't know as much about you as we should. So if you could just briefly give us a bit of a, a background. You've already started a little bit where you grew up, and um, but um, how you got yourself established as, a, as an ag journalist and... Um, uh, and then how you got to to where you are today looks like sitting in your very comfortable looking living room chatting with me. This is my office. This is my yeah. office. And I love it. You know, uh, you mentioned something about uh, where I grew up and somebody just told me recently, it says, you know, being raised isn't an option. Growing up is an option. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm still working on that one. But at the same time, I started out in a place called Plump Coulee, Manitoba, about five miles northeast where I grew up on my mom and dad's farm. And there were two, si or two uh, sisters and one brother. And one brother is still alive, and he's still actually farming at 86 years old. He's wow. uh, farming full wow. time. So I grew up, uh, you know, I loved sports. Uh, I loved all those kinds of things. And then when I got uh, to university, uh, my, I had promised my father in 1967, and when we had bought some land, that I would farm forever. Well, I met a girl who became my wife, and she passed away five years ago. And that's, uh, you know, it's, it's all good the way things have worked out. But at the same time, you know, when she looked at me, she says, I had failed out of grade 11. And she looked at me and she said, uh, Harry, I don't mind marrying a farmer, but I don't want to marry a dumb farmer. <laughs> so get back to university or school. So I went back and took my grade 12, you know, as a mature student at 22 years old and off to university one year, two years and came back in 1971. And uh, and I had promised my dad I would farm forever in 1967. Here's what my dad said. Farming wasn't good. Prices were terrible. And he says, Harry, there's an application in the local paper in Altona for a farm broadcaster at the radio station. You know what? I had never even thought of that. But I applied, Jim McSweeney, who was the program director, I applied and within a month I was in the studio. Off the tractor, into the studio, back onto the tractor because I was farming full time with my brother and my dad. And that was the start of my farm journalistic career. And I stayed there at that radio station, and I was able to travel. They didn't pay me a lot of money, but they gave me a tremendous expense account at the end of every month. And I was able to travel just about wherever I went, as long as I brought back the goods, and they were able to sponsor my reports from those particular meetings. And they took me wherever. And, uh, and then I uh, asked my general manager, Elmer Hildebrandt, I says, what can I do to become even better. And this was around 77, 78. And he says, there's a fellow by the name of Maynard, Maynard Spies. He was a farm broadcaster, WCCO, Minneapolis. And uh, I went to see him. 
he wasn't that friendly because he was busy and he was a great guy. And he, so we went for coffee. And at the end, I says, I says, Maynard, what can I do to become a better farm broadcaster? He said, join the National Association of Farm Broadcasters of America. And you know what? I came back, told my boss, and he had actually sent me there. So I, you know what? The next five years, I went to the annual meeting at, in Kansas City, Missouri, of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters of America. And that's where I took the next step as far as a journalist is concerned, because uh, they embraced me. They made me the chairman of the Canadian Broadcasters Committee, which were only two. <laughs> but that allowed me to share uh, at the annual business meeting about Canadian agriculture. That was probably next to starting as a farm broadcaster and my boss giving me the opportunity. That was the really the next big step for me. Wow, that's a, that's an interesting story, Harry. It tells me a couple of things, uh, useful lessons there. One of them is um, when an opportunity presents itself, uh, you don't necessarily have to take it, but you sure better take a good hard look at it and see whether that's a, a good opportunity for you. And then the other is take advantage and always look, uh, take advantage of opportunities and always be looking to improve yourself. So great, what a what a great story. So let's move on then to kind of the, the guts of our conversation today, if I can say that. And let's talk about getting our, that's the farming community's message out to the consuming public. Now, I hear frequently frustration on the part of people in agriculture, farmers or people who are associated with farmers, expressing frustration that, quote unquote, city people don't understand where their food comes from very well. And I've most recently, the penny dropped a little bit, and I thought, why would they know where their food, where would they learn this, right? They, they didn't go to grandma and grandpa's farm on, in the summer anymore, so why would they know this? So obviously this topic's important, and here I'm interested in your thoughts on what are some of the things we can do to get the information out about what, how we produce food, how we produce food that is so safe and so nourishing, and frankly, so much better than it was, let's call it a generation ago. There's been so much improvement. There's been a tremendous amount of improvement in how we produce our food. And number one, we got to make sure that our house is in order. You know, if we're going to tell a story, we better make sure our house is in order. I have a tagline. I have about 8,000 followers on Twitter, and I use it every day pretty well to do surveys and all kinds of things to get feedback. And, uh, and my tagline is simply this. I love to tell the story of farming, one farmer at a time. However, in order for me to tell that story, when I ask them, can I interview you? The, you know, sometimes the first thing they say, well, why me? And, and why, why should I tell my story? In fact, they're afraid, right? But that's changing. We get, we're getting more and more uh, female, male farmers that are telling the story of farming and telling it accurately. And, uh, you know, we just finished a discovery the, of the farm uh, here in Winnipeg, or just south of Winnipeg at the Glenlee Research Station just a couple of weeks ago. And they had 1,400 people come through. And our agricultural community, the egg producers, the hog producers, the cattle producers, the dairy people, they have individual shops, you know, booths, not only booths, but buildings where people can actually, through windows, see when a chicken lays an egg. And that's such a great story. And then they have a communications person, and I couldn't attend, but I talked to her, and I got all the different emails. And I did an article and interview with each individual representing one of those commodity groups. And it was published in a local paper or in an agriculture paper that I write for. So you know, number one, we got to have our house in order. Number two, we got to be absolutely certain that when somebody comes to our farm, they're coming to our farm in our best interest. And number two, you know, don't be afraid to learn how to communicate. I gave another thing, and I didn't talk about it before. 
I spent 10 years in Toastmasters International. I, you know, I was afraid to, to talk out loud in front of a public, uh, you know, but at the same time, I took Toastmasters and I learned to communicate all much better than what I could. And I wasn't afraid to tell the story of farming, but we need to get out there and do exactly what they did at the Glenlee Research Station and make sure that the house is in order and they show it and they're not afraid and they're not hiding anything. The, the, the thing that really bothers some people is if you're trying to hide something. And so we've got to make, open the door, open our minds and learn to say what it is we need to tell the people. Great, great, great comment. And what you're kind of referring to really is uh, transparency. And we hear that word uh, used a lot and Sometimes we get tired of words that get used a lot, and uh, but transparency isn't one of them. So let's drill down, Harry, a little bit. You're very familiar with the pig industry, and our audience is really primarily associated with the pig industry. What do you think are some of the key messages that you think we should uh, be getting out to our consuming public. So if somebody put a microphone in front of me and said, John, what would you like to say about the pig industry? What should I be talking about? You should be talking about number one, that we treat number one. I, if I'm in the pig business and this comes from Dr. John Carr, the world renowned veterinarian, you know, when he goes onto a farm, he likes to ask, and if he sees anybody mistreating an animal, he goes right to the boss. And he tells that boss, you know what? You don't, you should really not have that person on the farm. So number one, you know, the, the soil that we use to raise the feed is better today than it was years ago. And people don't always want to believe that. That's number one. Number two, you know, we get the animals, you know, we get the best genetics and we build the buildings that will house those pigs and those piglets and whatever else goes with it. And then we hire people. We hire people that love the industry and they don't only come to the farm for a job. They have to have an interest. And again, that comes straight from Dr. John Carr because I've done articles with him. He says, you know what? People need to love the pig in order to take it, take care of it properly. So when I'm asking you, and if somebody asks me, yes, number one, they look after their animals. It's their livelihood. They're not there to torture them. They feed them properly, and they also treat them properly, and then they get them to the marketplace in the proper way. Right. Okay. So animal well-being, animal care is really important to us. We sometimes have a different view. <clears throat> of what constitutes good animal care compared to some other people. So I'm going to keep drilling, Harry, because I know you're, you're up for it and you're knowledgeable enough to, to answer my questions. So how do we deal with that then? Yes, we can say we look after our animals. And when, when I go into a barn, you know, pretty, you pretty quickly you see what level of, of, love that the people have for their animals. Um, even before you get into the barn, you can see that. So if I'm, I'm not trying to convince somebody who is adamant that we mistreat our animals. They may be wrong, but they're probably have a pretty firm opinion, but there'll be a lot of people out there and they're getting information from different sources, often potentially not well-informed sources. So how do we how do we handle delivering that message? We know we look after the animals well, but how, what, what is it we need to say to these people to help them to better understand that? Well, I think number one, we have to be really careful that we don't only depend on the social media to get our message out. We got to make sure that we are there to tell that message. And I believe probably the best thing that we can do and uh, and we have to be careful, but is to open up our place and, and not just to have a, a one day thing and clean everything up so it all looks good. It's got to be that way all year around. 
So if somebody wants to come and see if it's possible, biosecurity has become a really big issue. So it isn't as possible as it was years ago. But we need to be able to show. We need to be able to show people that we are treating our animals properly. But then comes the other side. We have to be careful who we allow on our farm because not everybody is coming there for the right reason, at least not for our right reason. So we need to show and we need to keep telling them. And it's one thing to go on social media and say, oh yeah, we treat our pigs great, right? But we gotta be able to show them and tell them. More and more people on Twitter, on Facebook, whether it's LinkedIn, you know, they're doing their own videos and, and their own videos in such a way that they can actually show what is going on as far as that pig is concerned. And, you know, and there's so much uh, being talked about and being happening, but I think we have to really be careful that we show them exactly how we look after those pigs if there's an opportunity to do so. Yeah, a very good point. Very good point. Um, and we could continue this conversation for quite some time, Harry, um, because there's other issues in addition to animal welfare. Uh, there's the issue of, uh, of environmental sustainability. There's the uh, issues of, um, of uh, sort of climate and how agriculture interacts with climate. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we will have to say that for another time because we don't have enough time to get into all of those topics. I would like my the next thing for you to share with us because of your unique perspective. Uh, you mentioned about how things are better now than they were, let's say, when you were uh, a young lad bouncing around your your dad's farm. What are some of the changes that you have seen, and not necessarily just pork production, um, because you work with all aspects of agriculture, cropping, livestock, so on. What are some of the changes that uh, strike you as being particularly um, significant or most impressive about how agriculture has advanced in the last three, four, five decades? Let me go back to how my father farmed. And as I say, we had a thousand acres. It was a seed farm. We had some little bit of livestock for our own use. But at the same time, uh, dad, you know, he loved the land. I mean, I, I can't remember him wanting to burn the stubble because that just wasn't the right. He wanted to work that stubble into the soil. And so, so we worked that stubble into the soil. I mean, we plowed and harrowed and dissed and cultivated sometimes four and five passes on that same field in the fall until the snow flew. And then uh, my brother, he was nine years, is nine years older than I, and he came along. And so we went from the seeding drill and, and went to the disker. That immediately removed a couple of passes. We didn't plow anymore. We used the disker, turned the, the stubble upside down. So, you know, and from there, we went, uh, you know, and so one the first year we went with cedar discers. Uh, my dad was very upset because he couldn't see the rows. And the seeding drill put the rows in and he couldn't see it. And he was really discouraged because he loved to see his fields perfect. And then he said, said to my brother, he says, next year, we're going back to drills. And my brother says, if that happens, I quit farming. So we did not go back to the drill. We went to discard. Turn fast forward. You know, you know, dad just didn't know any better. I mean, he was using fertilizer, chemicals, and so forth. But then my brother started to go to meetings. My dad didn't have time, but my brother took the winter and started to go to meetings. The next thing was the uh, air seeder, you know, so, and my brother farms with his son. So first year they go into an air seeder. And again, it means a lot less. I mean, zero till, minimum till, whatever you want to call it. You're just not working that soil. You're leaving the straw. So he gets a new air seeder and they couldn't get it set, you know, no matter what they tried. So when that came up, it was not looking good. <laughs> it was not looking good. Some places had nothing. And so my brother gets upset and he says, you know what? <laughs> we're going to go back to discers. <laughs> oh, no. His son said, we're going to make sure that our air seeder works properly next year, right? So what I'm saying with this example, is that yes, there's a 
such a huge change. And I bet you, if you take that soil sample today, of where my father farmed in 1950, and my brother still farms that land, it, there's a great improvement. And when the wind blows, we don't have the dust storms that we used to have. So my story is to say, you know what? You know, farmers are the best environmentalists this world knows. Why? Because they are the ones that totally depend, number one, on the soil and the environment in where they're raising animals and where they're growing the crops. That's interesting, uh, Harry, you talk about some of those changes that makes me reflect on a gentleman that I worked with many, many years ago in Regina. His name was Earl Johnson, and he was a cropping man. I don't know if you knew Earl, but he, he was a good guy. And my my understanding would be that his his information he shared was pretty darn good. And he made the comment to me one day that when Western Canada transitioned from horses to power machinery, it immediately uh, freed up 40% of the acres that in Western Canada that no longer needed to be planted to oats to feed the horses. 40%. Wow. You know, that, that, that's an awesome statement because that's exactly true. And I know my father, I don't remember my father farming with horses. He was already into the steel horsepower as quickly and as early as he could because that's just the way he felt things needed to go. Yes. Yeah. So it, it uh, you know, I think, well, I think farmers generally are proud of their story. Um, but I might say, and it's important for folks like you who have provided us with information that we, we know what part of our story to tell. Because with when you're involved in farming, you're doing it every day. You're involved in it every day. You take everything for granted, right? Well, of course, I get up early in the morning. Of course, I work hard all day long. And of course, when it's seeding and harvest, everything else goes by the side because that's what I have to do. And um, and so you take it for granted where um, I think people in the city just don't appreciate how much land gets seeded so quickly across Canada in, in the springtime and how much land gets harvested so quickly in the fall. I think it's an absolute marvel. I shared with somebody the other day, my cultivator, the only implement I ever bought was a 12 foot cultivator, 12 foot. And now they're a hundred feet plus, right? And so you're not making the passes. That, that we used to make, right? So that in itself is a, a big example. But somebody once told me that, uh, and this goes back probably 15, 20 years, that you give farmers 10 days to two weeks in the spring with you know proper weather, proper soil conditions, the crops in the ground. And, you know, and, and that's exactly right. My brother, you know, my father didn't have time to go camping. When my brother gets married in 1964, 65, he buys a camper. And on a long weekend, he went camping. And dad says, what are you doing? Well, he says, you know, the equipment's bigger. We're doing it. And we're going to take off the time that we need to take off. So absolutely, you know, and 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 combining and harvesting. I mean, you see farmers, you know, they're doing stuff now that they never did before during harvest time. Why? They're waiting. You know, we, you know. They're waiting for the next crop to get ready. And, and so once it's ready, boom, they get on there and do it. Yeah, you talk about waiting. It's not something farmers do very well. And uh, yesterday, my, my wife and I were out for, we went out for a picnic about an hour outside of Ames. And uh, we passed through the town of Stratford. And there was about a dozen semis all lined up waiting to unload at the elevator. And I can just imagine the language going on inside those trucks as they waited in line to unload so they could get back to the farm and, and get on it, get another load going. You know what they're doing, though? They yeah. do have their iPhones. Oh, or absolutely. Or whatever phone it may be. And they're continuing to do business even when they're waiting. I didn't want to, you know, I just thought. Yeah, I'd, that's a good point. I, yep. that, nope. <laughs> very, very good point, Harry. Very good point. It's time for our famous three. 
the Nutrition Athena, Shakespeare Mill, Farmhouse, and Nutrition Partners Nutrition Group offer the full range of nutritional product based on extensive research and developments and a solid team of experts all across Canada. Our objective is to provide cost-effective solutions, innovation, and support to producer from the entire Canadian swine industry. So here, let's uh, swap up here and let's change uh, uh, to the three questions we ask of all of our guests. And the first question I have for you is, do you have a favorite book on pigs or swine or pork production? You know, the one, the only pig or swine production books I read, and we have in Manitoba in February coming up, beginning of February, the Manitoba Swine Seminar. And they put out a book of proceedings of the speakers of that particular uh, event. And you know what? I probably look at that more so than anything else. And But at the same time, I was invited two and a half years ago onto a WhatsApp group. It's called HB Hogs, Hatterian Brethren uh, Hog Producers. And there's about 450 on that particular WhatsApp group. And they're not all Hatterian Brethren. They're, they're suppliers, they're farmers from US, from Canada. And I've been part of that. You know, I'm on it every day because I'm learning every day from these farmers. I'm seeing equipment. I'm seeing these guys, you know, do whatever they do. And you have to be careful how much we say they do, right? But at the same time, you know, they're showing that on videos and and, and there's strong administration. So they asked me to come on and, and give them a, some, you know, some not so much advice, but stability that uh, I could let them because sometimes they get out of hand, right? And they still do, but it's an awesome training ground. And anybody wants to be on it that's involved in the hog business, all they got to do is let me know and, and I'll get them on because that to me is where I'm learning more about pig production than I've ever learned before. Right. Well, very good. In, interesting. Interesting. And how times change, Harry. Uh, my second question then is, uh, is, do you have a favorite book period? Not necessarily on swine. It can be on any topic, is there a book that was particularly striking to you that you'd like to share with our listeners? You know, I would like to say the Bible as one, but we'll leave that at up. But I wrote and read a lot of books about communication. And, uh, you know, there's so many different books. And I've got one here that I picked out of my, my big box of garbage and it says, write it down, make it happen, knowing what you want and getting it. You know, it's, it's something that I've I've been reading but you know what I have so many I used to read one book every week that related to community I was a professional speaker for 25 years and so I remember one book that said say it in six minutes because <laughs> yes, this, person, yes. This, this individual had taken you know every newscaster you know the 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 person who who's who's the anchor you know, they use about six minutes in, in 30 minutes where they say their piece. And, and you know what? And uh, and so uh, that's that's the other thing. Say it, you know, when you're communicating, you know, listen. You know, I, I've read so many books about listening. Oh, man, it's such an important aspect. of. And then there's one other thing, and this wasn't a book, but it's a saying that you can do almost anything if you don't worry about who gets the credit. That was on President Ronald Reagan's desk and apparently is in his uh, presidential uh, museum in Los Angeles. You can do almost anything if you don't worry who gets the credit. Interesting, isn't it? Yes, interesting. Our third, our third question, Harry, then is, um, I think particularly a good one for uh, students who might be listening or for young people just starting their career. And that is from your perspective, what is it that sets the most successful professionals in the swine area apart from the crowd? What, what makes them special or extra successful? You know, I, I, there's a family of three uh, that started a, a big operation in eastern Manitoba. And I, I followed them and, and, you know, they, they initially didn't want to tell anybody 
about what they were doing. But they did. You know, I, I was part of the Farm Writers and Broadcasters Association, and we got them to host us, and they told their story. You know, and you could tell these people loved their industry. You know, they loved their animals. They loved their, and, and the same thing with, again, with my father, with my brother, with all the people that I know. You can tell them, you know, uh, in, you know, I could say you could tell them by their, by their four by fours and so forth. And, but at the same time, you no, know, I, I think it's the, the, um, the air of, some people may even call it arrogance, but it isn't. It's a professional confidence that I'm doing what I was called to do and I'm doing it because I love it. And not only that, I'm doing it because I'm making a good living at it. And I've interviewed so many farmers, you know, where you take the one farmer who, who who's just interested in, in getting the crop in the ground and, and I mean, those days are, are over, but that's how it used to be, right? And then there's those farmers who absolutely, you know, we, we have a, a, a meat shop here in Winkler and they just had a great expansion and they're a dad and two brothers. They're farming, they're beef producers as well. They have a feedlot. And I remember one of the first stories I did with the manager and he was the young fella. And he says, uh, I said, how are you making this thing work? He says, I have a formula that when I sell a piece, one pound of hamburger, I know exactly what that pound of hamburger cost me. And he says, I never lose money on any hamburger going out the store because I know what it cost me. You know, and, and when you see farmers like that, you know, and they're talking in the coffee shop. I mean, I don't go to many coffee shops, but I know what they're talking there. You know, there's all kinds of there, there's there's the stuff and then there's the real stuff. And and then on on a WhatsApp group, like I just mentioned, the hog group, and there's an agricultural group called Canadian Agriculture. And I just talked to one of the fellows here uh, about an hour ago. And he's telling me he always does a video every day about what he's doing on the farm. And today he was the last day of he said, good morning, kids. This is my last day of harvesting corn silage. I'm sick of it. I'm done. <laughs> Tomorrow I start with my grain harvest, you know. But these guys are proud of what they do. And gals, not only guys, but guys and gals. And you know what? That's And when I talk specifically about the pig business, we have a, a school of agriculture at, in Brandon, Manitoba, you know, uh, the Assiniboine Community College. And they just named it. Uh, the Russell Edwards uh, School. And here they are now training a four-year course. Guess what? For pig technicians. You know, they can take the evening course and they can be hired and, and they have to have an interest in pigs and they have to have an interest in looking after those pigs and they're trained on how to do it. And that's really the most important part that when I see a farmer it doesn't only mean that his truck is shiny and his equipment is clean. No, he knows what it costs, and he's telling others and sharing with them what it is. And I think that's the other thing, you know, that, that people are willing to share uh, the, their own experiences. And because that's what Twitter is all about, the ag Twitter. You know, people say, well, how do you do that? And there's three or four guys that are saying, this is how you do it. You know, that's a... That's a great way to, I think, end our podcast. A uh, great thought. And, uh, you know, we're all naturally attracted to people who are enthusiastic, right? And, uh, and I guess if we want to get our story out and, uh, and well delivered, we have to be enthusiastic about it, uh, just like you are, Harry. So uh, thank you so very much. We really appreciate you joining us for this half hour today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. It's been my pleasure and uh, keep up the good work. Take care. Have a good day.